St John's has a really warm place in the heart of Langham because you've been our mission partners for over a decade now and we are very grateful for the support that you've offered us both financially but also in prayer. And of course we're very grateful for the fact that you released him to be able to go and work in Papua New Guinea as part of one of the Langham programs, the preaching program. We have three programs within Langham, the preaching program, the scholars program and the literature program and we'll hear a little bit more about those later. But I wanted to introduce you to the preaching program, which is fundamental and core to the work of Langham, through a video. And the video is actually looking at the preaching program and the work that's happening in Fiji and, uh, and throughout the South Pacific, but focusing particularly on Fiji. So let's have a look at the video and see what, what's going on there. Fijian village, we live communally. There's no I or me, myself. You're not your own, you're not an individual, you're part of this group. There's a sense in which you're always part of this family and this land. My name is Pio Nakesu. I'm also known as Tukana. Tukana is a Fijian word for junior, so I'm named after my grandfather. I'm uh, the pastor here at Namandi Heights Baptist Church, which is a small church in Suva, Fiji, and I'm also the country coordinator for Langham Preaching. We grew up with, uh, because we were close to the ocean, so a lot of fishing and farming. Your fam in, uh, in Fijian cultures, your family, your land, your people, they are your stronghold. They are things you hold on to very close to your heart. You never abandon family, you never disappoint family. Christianity came to our shores, uh, those two things were able to blend in well. Eh? The, the Lotu and the Vanua, that's how we would say it. So people have a respect for Christianity and they respect it because you know it's part of the culture and not really because of who Christ is. The preaching that's going on, there's no proper teaching of God's Word. There's other things, not the Word. Of course, they put up scriptures, they would begin, uh, uh, scripture today is this, but they end up talking about something else, and in the end, everybody goes home. And I think sometimes people think it's a waste of time coming to church, because there's nothing there. I'm dealing with my own struggles, for growing up as a pastor's kid and, and my own relationship with my father. One of the biggest things was the idea that if you give, then God will bless you with riches. And I watched my dad give everything and we became poorer and poorer and poorer. He still subscribes to that uh, line of teaching. He's recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. I can see physically he's getting worse, but somehow he still believes that things are only going to get better if you keep giving more money that you don't have. It's all about what you do for God, and God will be obligated to give you back. I'm still waiting for that to happen, but uh, sadly I don't see it. I don't see that. When I decided I would become a pastor, but not a pastor in his setup, the sort of teaching that he subscribed to, it made the relationship a lot more uh, trickier. Some of his comments were really harsh, and that is hard. Yeah, it causes a lot of stress. And, yeah. I'm sad, I'm sad for my family, I'm sad for my dad. Because I said, you know, he, he really made a difference in our family in that he stood for what he believed for. But when what you believe is not the right thing, you 
given yourself over to misinterpreted teaching, twisted teachings of, uh, of God's written word. But what he doesn't see is that faithful Bible teaching, uh, people long for it as well. With the Langham training, churches are getting serious about understanding what God's Word actually says. We've got preachers that are now growing themselves, growing personally by their own study of God's Word. So we have more people now that have, uh, are trusting God's Word, preaching God's Word faithfully and helping other people to grow. Prior to pastor bringing Langham in and introducing this to our elders, mm. our elders never, they couldn't. Whenever a pastor went away, they'd have to bring in somebody else to preach. The teaching in this church is different. Being true to the text, you know, going from that to how it applies to our lives. And boy, you know, almost every preaching, it applies to my life. With Langham, we are able to make it more clearer and simpler that even the young ones pick it up. I, uh, I enjoyed Langup so much, level one, I did it twice. <laughs> Knowing about how to preach Christ to others, uh, I've learned how to, there's a kind of a sacredness to it. Preaching, standing from up there and preaching, you know, it takes courage, it takes, uh, you know, to preach some uh, God's, and you preaching God's word is very important. And when I took a Langham, Langham training, you know, it helped me a lot, it really taught me no, no, to deep, uh, to dig deeply in the Bible passage. Langham is a gift from God for us. Introducing to level uh, Langham level one, it actually helped us to see what, how to write our Bible talk, how to see things from within the passage. And, and for us as staff, that was a big turnaround. It was a great tool. I would thank God that we were introduced to Langham. I love about preaching is, I mean, I've discovered something that I'm discovering for the same time. When, when I can communicate the same excitement, helping them discover it for themselves in the text. My prayer and my wish is that, not just my dad, for the, for the many people in Fiji that have been tricked into this false idea, these misinterpreted scriptures that they've subscribed to, that they would see the truth. They would see the truth and, and believe in the, in the actual teaching of the Bible, so they can be free from, from believing in a lie. That health and wealth prosperity gospel is probably the biggest challenge that the church around the majority world is facing today. The majority world is what we call all those parts of the world that are not the West, basically. And, uh, and it's desperately important that people are able to hear the true and faithful preaching of the Word of God. Takana is, just this year, has been appointed to be the regional coordinator looking after all the South Pacific which is Tonga, uh, Fiji, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and we've just started working amongst the Indigenous people here in Australia as well, and Takana is heading up all that work, so it's very exciting. As we come to God's Word today, let's just uh, bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we, we pray that you will open our hearts and our minds so that we will be able to hear your Word understand what it means for us, and apply it to our lives. In your son's name, amen. Now, I am what I like to call a passionate gardener. I'm passionate, just not very good. I love to grow things, and I especially love to grow fruit and vegetables. And my passion, combined with my lack of talent, means that often the Friends and family and passers-by on the street are inundated with more zucchini that they can ever possibly use while having absolutely nothing of vegetables that are a little bit harder to grow. 
but I've always wanted to have a productive passion fruit vine. And when I moved into my little house a couple of years ago with a fairly unsightly front fence, this was my opportunity. For two years, I watched that passion fruit vine grow and flourish and cover the fence with not a single fruit produced. I didn't even have flowers, just a healthy, happy vine. But when we hit the two year mark, suddenly everything changed. My passion fruit vine was literally dripping with fruit, so much so that I was back to accosting the friends and relatives and strangers on the street to help me manage the harvest. It wasn't that the vine had been sick or even unfruitful for two years. It just hadn't matured enough yet to be ready and able to bear the fruit that I was longing for. A healthy, mature vine is a very different thing and I continue to enjoy the harvest today. Now our passage today deals with fruit and maturity of the Colossian variety. Paul writes to the Colossians with gladness and thanks for their faith and love, but with the powerful exhortation that everyone, all Christians, must be moving beyond their conversion and their first growth in Jesus to a maturity in Christ that bears much fruit. So today we'll see that the Colossians were a growing, healthy church who had heard and responded to the gospel. But we'll see that Paul didn't see that as being enough and he prayed for their increase in maturity through their knowledge of the word. And we'll also see how we're called to help bring the whole church to maturity in Christ through faithful, clear and relevant biblical teaching and preaching. So I want to take a look at these first verses in the book of Colossians and remind ourselves of not just our own responsibility to be growing healthy disciples of Jesus, but to echo Paul's call to present everyone as fully mature in Christ. Now verse 2 in the opening words in Paul's letter to the Colossians, it says, God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. The ancient city of Colossae was built on a major trade route that ran through the Lycus River Valley in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is sort of southwest Turkey today. Colossae was a smaller and much less significant business centre than its nearby city of Laodicea, but both towns were wiped out by an earthquake, one in AD 17 and another one in AD 60. The town was rebuilt after each earthquake, but it never really became prominent again. Now, Paul had spent two years planting a church in Ephesus, and the word of God had radiated out from there, resulting in a church being planted in Colossae, probably by Epaphras, with the majority of the church probably being Gentiles. The Colossian church, incidentally, was home to Philemon, who you might recognise as the owner of the runaway slave Onesimus. Paul's opening words to the Colossians are filled with gratitude to God for them. In verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood it. You learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who's also told us of your love in the spirit. So the Colossian church are Christians. They've heard and they've understood the gospel as it was brought to them by Epaphras, and now they're showing the fruit of faith in Jesus and love for all God's people. Now this is something that Paul rejoices about, and it's something for us to rejoice about when we hear the stories of people who heard the true gospel and responded with faith and love. 
So many of Paul's letters deal with false gospels where people have heard the good news but they've contaminated it with other beliefs or practices. The Colossians have heard it, believed it and truly understood the true gospel. They've shown the reality of conversion through Epaphras and now the growth of the church and the growth in the numbers of those who are believers and are beginning to show the fruit of their union with Christ shows their grafting into the true vine. Now, just as an aside about Epaphras, there's only three sentences in the whole New Testament that mention him by name, yet he leaves a really powerful legacy as a faithful minister who wrestles in prayer for those he's building up in their faith and who joyfully brings back reports of their spiritual growth. It's not Epaphras who's bringing forth the fruit, that's the work of the Holy Spirit through the gospel, but he is a faithful minister and trainer and equipper, as well as the messenger back to his home church. He's causing great rejoicing amongst those who sent him out as they hear the reports of the Colossians' faith. The whole first chapter of Colossians and the ministry of Epaphras and Paul to the Colossians seems to me to emphasise the building up of the church and the equipping of it for its growth in depth and maturity. And this is the mission and vision of Langham Partnership. It's about coming alongside the church that already exists and has heard the gospel throughout the world but working with it to bring forth the fruit of a maturing vine. It's a task that is needed right throughout the church, whether in the West, as we are, or in the majority world that is lacking in resources to help in this goal. And it's a task that requires the whole church to be building up, encouraging and equipping the whole church. The focus for Langham Partnership is on the training and equipping of biblical teachers and preachers like Takana so that the church can hear and truly understand the fullness of God's word, as have the Colossians. So let us, whether we're in ministries like Langham or at home praying in the pews, be like Epaphras. Let us be deeply concerned for the biblical faithfulness of the church constant in prayer for its growth in depth and rejoicing in the encouragement and blessing of the growing depth of the church. But I think the most important thing to note about these opening verses of Colossians chapter 1 is this exhortation to remember to pray, not only for those who have not heard the gospel and for those who have not yet responded to the gospel, but for those who have heard it and responded to it. Our task as believers is not just to go into the world and make disciples, but to teach them everything that he has taught. The job is not finished at conversion. Our prayers of thankfulness for that conversion need to go hand in hand with prayers for the growing faith and love that spring from that already received gospel. Secondly, as we we need to remember that as we relate to people in our own context as well as other contexts, how encouraging it is to bring news of others who have faith in Christ Jesus. Particularly in the West, where the stories that we hear claim that Christianity is dying. It's a powerful witness when we hear of majority world Christians who are growing in their faith and in love for God's people. In about the 1980s, the church in China was very heavily persecuted and it was closed to Western missionaries who weren't able to go in. And so we didn't know what was happening to the Christians in China and for a long time we thought that perhaps there wouldn't be any Christians left in China. But then when it began to open up again in the, the late 80s and into the 90s, we heard of an explosion of faith within that country and it was so encouraging. So encouraging to hear of what God had been doing to grow his church under that oppression. I went as a guest to a little village in Kenya. Uh, it was quite remote and it seemed to me to be completely unchanged from forever. And I, I 
can remember how delighted the little Christian community there was to discover that I came from Australia and the gospel had reached Australia. They were so excited. The news of other believers in the majority world is a gift we can share with the churches in our own countries. And I'm constantly amazed at how little understanding many Christians in Australia have of the flourishing of the gospel around the world. And it's an encouragement that works both ways. As we hear of the Christians persisting faithfully in their context, which may include poverty, pressure, even persecution, I've found that it's encouraging for them to hear about faithful believers holding fast to the truth here in Australia and in other decadent, idolatrous Western societies. We're able to bring news of each other and the faith that the Christians have around the whole world to each other, just as Paul was able to rejoice with the Colossians. And now, in these opening verses, the Colossians have heard the gospel and believed it, and they have a reputation that is encouraging to mature Christians everywhere. They have a reputation for open responsiveness to the gospel and bringing forth much fruit as they understand it. Their fruit is faith and love in the spirit, working itself out in their daily lives. Each one of us might ask, what is our reputation? And is it one that causes rejoicing and encouragement amongst those who hear about us? So it's after a very positive and affirming opening that the next sentence comes as a little bit of a jarring shock. Verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. Now, it's not just that Paul goes on to pray for them. He specifically tells us that it's in light of the positive beginning that he's moved to pray continually for them. Now, normally, we're moved to pray for people who are in great trouble or distress or suffering. Normally, being moved to pray for somebody is a sign that not all is well. But Paul has just been rejoicing in the conversion and growth in faith among the Colossian believers, gladly acknowledging that they did truly understand the gospel. So clearly, being converted and having understood and responded to the gospel is not sufficient. And now there is a call for ongoing growth and the first references to the maturity that Paul longs to see developing in them. We continually ask God, verse 9, to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. So what is the Christian maturity that Paul is praying here for the Colossians? There's many kinds of maturity. A, a physically mature body is one that grows as an adult and functions as an adult should and is healthy. Intellectual maturity is about having clarity of thought and consistency of thinking. We can become psychologically mature by becoming self-aware and having healthy relationships with other people and accepting responsibility. But the scriptures urge us towards developing spiritual maturity, or as Paul calls it later in verse 28, maturity in Christ. Now, Paul often uses the expression to be in Christ as an explanation of what it means to be a Christian. He talks about being united with Christ in an organic living manner, the way the body is connected to and united to the head. Or in John, we hear of the way that branches are united with and organically connected to the vine. It's more than just an intellectual agreement or a series of habits that make us look and behave like the Christians around us. It's where one's whole being and existence is completely 
linked with Christ, drawing all of our sustenance and energy and life directly from him. So if to be a Christian is to be in Christ, united with Christ, to be a mature Christian is to have a mature relationship with Christ. A mature relationship bears fruit, going back to John's description of the vine and the branches. The Christian is connected to Christ. The mature Christian is deeply united in a relationship in which we trust him and we worship him and we obey him. The mature Christian engages with the word of God in its fullness, verse 25 and 26, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christians deepen in maturity through their growing wisdom and understanding so that they are able to live a life worthy and pleasing to God, strengthened with all power through his spirit in order to bear the fruit of endurance and patience. So this is the Christian life beyond conversion into discipleship. This is seeing believers grow and their fruit grow to stand firm with endurance and patience, which is only needed when times are tough. So the next question then is, how do we grow in our maturing relationship with Christ? J.I. Packer wrote a book called Knowing God where he talks about the fact that we are pygmy Christians because we have a pygmy God. In other words, we won't grow into a full relationship with God until we have a full understanding of who he is. The Lord that we worship and grow in relationship to must be the real Lord, the Christ of the scriptures. The more we know of and understand of Christ, the more we're able to grow in our relationship with him, maturing in all wisdom and understanding. It's crucial that Christians know our Lord through the words he's given us in the Bible, through the full riches and depth of knowledge available to us. The danger is in only relating to a pygmy picture of our Lord because we do not truly grasp the wonder and depth of who he is. And I think that's why Paul, after telling the Colossians how he's praying for their maturing, immediately goes into a beautiful expression of the supremacy of Christ, firstborn over all creation, through whom and in whom all things are created. And he goes on to encourage them to continue in their faith, to stand firm and not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the patience and endurance of maturity he's already prayed for them. It's a lot like the tree that's planted by the water site and will not be moved. It's not a sapling. It's not a tree that's struggling to thrive in inhospitable soil. It's a tree that is firmly rooted and grounded and fed by the streams of living water. So this is our goal, our aim, to grow in our wisdom and understanding of the fullness of Christ and the word so that we are fully, deeply connected to him, in him, firmly and unshakably united to him. And it's the real Christ, the Christ of the true gospel, who we come to know through the pages of the scriptures. And the goal is for everybody. No one is excluded from the goal of deepening, maturing relationship and bearing of fruit. So it's into this context of a desire for growing Christian maturity by having the wisdom and understanding that comes from knowing the word of God in all its fullness, that Langham Partnership is working with the church throughout the world. Now, we know that not everybody has the opportunity to hear and learn the fullness of the word of God or to have it taught to them with wisdom and understanding. We struggle with it here in Australia where we have resources and theological education and access to the great works of theologians and scholars to help us where we have teachers and preachers who are well-trained and equipped to help us grow. But what of the Christians in the majority world, the world other than what we call the West, for whom eight out of 10 pastors have no training, for whom there are no theological works that are in their language 
and written by someone who understands and lives in the culture of the believers. Here in Australia, as in the US and the UK and many other Western countries, we may well say that the churches are dying and diminishing in size, but we are the minority. In the majority world, it's estimated that 160,000 people are coming to Christ every single day. The worldwide church is not just growing, it's exploding as people are drawn to Christ from the Middle East, from Asia and Africa, and Latin America, from Central and Eastern Europe, and from the Pacific Islands. But are these precious brothers and sisters being presented as fully mature in Christ, or are they struggling to grasp the whole story of the scriptures? Are they vulnerable to being blown about by the winds of every passing doctrine or distortion of scripture? We've seen a little of the challenge just in one country in Fiji. How? Are they to grow in all wisdom and understanding if they're not being taught faithfully, clearly and relevantly by pastors who are trained and supported in their understanding of the word? Many of my colleagues throughout Langham Partnership talk about the fact that they, before being trained by the Langham Preaching Program, would just have an idea for what they were going to preach today and without any preparation or work to put the sermon together, they would just pluck verses from here and there to support whatever idea they had. And of course, that meant they only ever referred to their favourite verses, leaving whole sections of the Bible untouched and untaught. The logic that underpins the work of Langham Partnership is that God wants his church to grow up into maturity, as we've seen today from the Word. And that growing maturity comes from engaging with the word of God in its fullness, again, as we've seen today. We know that most people engage with the scriptures through the teaching that they receive. So the best way to increase the maturity of the worldwide church is to equip the teachers and preachers to teach clearly, faithfully and relevantly. The work that Langham does is one mission delivered through three programs. Through the preaching program, we foster national preaching movements that provide grassroots training through the preaching program for over 10,000 preachers every year. Through the literature program, we provide over 600 theological colleges and seminaries, in addition to tens of thousands of individual pastors with books, and resources and materials to help them understand God's word and its application to them today. And through the Scholars Program, we provide scholarships for the training of the next generation of theological leaders to be equipped to establish and lead the theological colleges in their home countries, as well as to be able to write and develop Christian resources in their own language and culture so that Christians can have access to materials written in their own language by someone from within the cultural context in which they live, not just translated from another culture entirely. Langham Partnership recognises the growth in, the Christian, in Christianity worldwide and rejoices in the news of faithful believers coming to Christ and growing in their knowledge and understanding. But we also acknowledge the challenges and obstacles faced by many of our brothers and sisters in gaining a full understanding of the word of God because of the lack of resources and training for leaders and pastors. And we also recognise that we in the West face a similar problem if we can't hear the voices of our brothers and sisters bringing their wisdom and insight and gifts from the Lord to bear on the worldwide church that includes us. We need the whole body to be listening to the whole body in order to grow in maturity and wisdom. The ultimate goal, a goal that Paul had for the entire body of Christian believers, is for everybody to be presented mature in Christ. Just as we rejoice to hear of the growth of the gospel worldwide, as Paul does with the Colossians, 
And just as our brothers and sisters throughout the world have heard and received the gospel, like the Colossians, now is the time to be praying with Paul and contending together to help every believer be filled with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding. Now is the time to be maturing the plant so that it gives forth good fruit as we grow in the knowledge of God. Let us thank God for those who have heard and believed, like the Colossians. But now we pray for the maturity of each believer and the church worldwide. And now is the time for those of us blessed with material resources to be working hand in hand, side by side, and together with our brothers and sisters, so that they and we might be part of that process. I invite you to talk more with me after the service to talk about how we can work together to see the worldwide church growing in depth and maturity as we give thanks for him bringing us to into the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins.